So I kind of got myself thrown off by moving my Hebrews class that we were doing on Sunday afternoon to the morning. And I, I started reading and been coming across this idea, the problems that are facing Christians. And, and one of them is that they're not reading their Bibles and we're not going into textual type of studies. Um, topical is good. You know, I mean, that's, that's one method of preaching and teaching is when you teach topically. And you can do that. It's great. I mean, you can take a topic and then you can go and then study the scriptures and stuff. But it just more and more, I think, you know, it's time to kind of spend some uh, opportunities to look and dig into some of the books that are important to us. Uh, but, and one of the reasons I thought of was going through the book of Acts and looking at the uh, Paul writing these letters is how he would write those letters and then send them. And then one of them, he says, and after you've read this, pass it on. You know, send it to the other churches. And so it was something that was read. It was something that was studied. And some of these are very difficult at times. And if, if we don't take the time to kind of read through them as well. So we're going to be looking in the book of Romans. I passed out. I tried to get one to you, an outline. Um, and I would like you to go ahead and just kind of look it over. T tonight is almost like the syllabus in a class. You know, when you, your professor says, okay, this is what's going to go on and stuff like that. So tonight's kind of the syllabus before we really start to dive into it. And I think that's always important. I thought, well, I'm so excited, I want to just jump into chapter 1 and we'll just get into the meat of it and go. But it is important to kind of bring up the textual side and some of the settings and backgrounds to understand why, why was the letter even written and things. So that's what we're going to do today is kind of look at some of the, the overview of the letter. Uh, the, the, the author... You know, this is kind of like the syllabus thing, you know, where you go into just kind of the can kind of stuff and the, every letter you look at. Uh, Hebrews, we started with that one and we looked at that and it used to be accredited to Paul and because his name's not there and a lot of other things and some scholars go, mm, can't really say it was Paul. When I grew up, it was Paul. If you ever heard a preacher or teacher talking and they would reference it, they'd say, well, when Paul wrote Hebrews and now scholars are like, ah, to me, it's not that important. If you want to keep saying it's Paul, that's fine. But it, it does kind of make you understand if it was Paul or Apollos. So it, it is kind of a neat thing to understand the writer. This one's not contested, you know, uh, Paul says right off the bat. And that's the thing about the difference between Hebrews is he doesn't say straight up like he does in almost all of his letters where he says, I, Paul, bond servant of, you know, or some sort of an introduction like that. So understand the character reframe yourself and think about what he's gone through and that will help you to understand how he's able to write the way he's writing versus James or Peter you have a man who was raised in a Gentile region in Galatia um, and had both a Roman parent and a Jewish parent he automatically had citizenship as a Roman. He was trained in the ways of Judaism, and he developed a trade as was being taught. The region that he comes from, Galatia, was, is a form of a type of place you would send your kids for an education. Now, the Harvard of that day and age, well, they all went to Athens. <laughs> but there was a learning center there where he grew up. And then we know he went down at some point, he went down to Jerusalem, and there he then devoted himself even more and became a student of Gamaliel, which is a very highly respected um, Jewish leader, a Pharisee, developed himself into follow, following that sect of Phariseeism, which was very, very legalistic. And so he, he was, that was the way he was trained. He had a mind that was very sharp when it comes to Mosaic law. He was like a lawyer, and you'll see this. That's important in this when we start to go into how he develops these arguments. It is even said there, and I've heard and read back some while back, that there were some law schools. I think, I think it was SMU where they used the book of Romans and taught it in legal for lawyers to go through and look at his rhetoric and the way that he develops his concepts and ideas and then supports, defends, builds, and builds upon that and that argument and the way he flows through it. This, this book is, is, is so important in many ways. You'll see as we go through this on what it does for us. 
The date is also something that's kind of significant because when it comes to the date, and by the way, your outline doesn't have this part on it. Your, your outline you got is just, just the outline. Um, so in case you're looking for my notes on what I said up there. But it was written before the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, we don't know exactly what his age was, um, but it was written between approximately 57, 58 A.D. He's believed to have been executed by the Romans in, in uh, Rome by beheading about 60 A.D., so this is written close to that time. He is on his, uh, really his last missionary journey where he finally goes back to Corinth again, and he's on his way back. He will end up going and being arrested in Jerusalem, and from there he will make it to Rome, but not the way he thinks in this letter. But he has that desire. So when he does this and he's writing this, he's sitting in the city of Corinth. Now think of Corinth. We've talked about Corinth. It has a whole dynamic and culture going on and the problems that he's dealing with there. But he was a young man by today's standards when he wrote this. You know, when we talk about old men, you know, when I was 30, it was 60. Now I'm 60, it's 120. I, I try to double it, you know, to make it push it out. But for that culture and day and age, uh, you know, a 60-year-old man was old. You know, he, a 60-year-old man to live because of the culture and things. So he was approximately, it's estimated, nothing factual, you can disagree, was pro possibly around the same age as Jesus. So it would put him, they believe, around 35 or so, 36, when he uh, was converted. And it was based on that, so he's pushing in his upper 40s when this letter is written. So he's already had some years of experience and such. And he doesn't have much, many years left. So that when you take in consideration to the other letters that are written as well, you'll see this flow here and why, why he's thinking of it. Uh, the church at Rome is who he's writing it to. He's writing it to Christians in the church of Rome. There to this point is no record, and there is no historical record of, of any apostle going to Rome and establishing a group of Christians and converting anyone. There's really not an, a source of of how they even became a church that we know of secularly outside of the Bible that we can read and go, and then this guy, Joe, he traveled to Rome and then he talked and he converted and then, aha, there it is. We don't have that. It's just sort of a conclusion that when they scattered and they returned back after the death of Stephen, that they took this word back and some of those were from the city of Rome and they went back and then taught, and that's how they were established. This church has been developed a reputation, and he talks about this, uh, without even having an apostle go there and establish and give them the gifts and all, you know, the Holy Spirit and the powers and all of this. Now, let me correct myself. It doesn't mean that just because an apostle didn't travel to Rome and establish this church, that they didn't have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Men who were present in Jerusalem that about five-year time period that had traveled to Pentecost, had been there during all that, the feast days, and then stuck around. Some of them had their hands, they had hands laid on them, and they received gifts of the Holy Spirit from apostles local there in Jerusalem. So when the scattering occurs, it's highly possible, and I do believe that some of those individuals who traveled back they all had some gift of the Holy Spirit. And that would help them to be able to establish. So they have some gifts, but Paul, will, you'll see where he, he's wanting to give them more. There's something to, that we can look at. He wants to give them the gift. He wanting, and some have said, well, see there, they didn't have the gift of the Holy Spirit or anything. I, I don't think that can be supported either. I, I think that's pushing it the other direction, considering how did they get the gospel? Well, it must have been from someone that was in Jerusalem, and then at the scattering, we read where they all left and departed and went back to their homes. Well, Rome would have been one of them. So I think the source of their gift is very logical. It came from Jerusalem. And so they did have it. Um, they had that. And that's important to understand because that means they had the ability to prophesy, to speak in tongues, and do things that would help to edify, build up, and, and develop that church. Now, there may be other things that maybe they didn't have because we know the Spirit gave certain gifts and such. But the church was a good, sound church. But there was some conflict there. 
And some of this goes off outside the Bible that we don't hear about, but it involves Nero and this Christos and some of the historians that were writing around this time period. And one of them was documenting the life of Nero and other Roman his history when they write about this incidental historical little event that occurred, and it had to do with the Christos. And see, now remember, that the, the Romans didn't see really much of a difference initially between a Jew and a Christian. They, they just saw it was Christian infighting. But it was huge. There was a lot of infighting going on between the Jews and the Christians because they were Jews as well. Most of the first Christians were Jews. So you had these Jews fighting. And so from the outside, the Romans looked at them and go, you know, these Jews are fighting among themselves. And so they looked at it as that. And so there was some strife and some conflict that did develop to the point where he did you know all the christians were told to leave they end up returning at this point when paul is writing they have come back so there, there has been some strife between the local jews and the christians in this church in rome so but don't don't misunderstand that they may have been the target audience but it really is well meant for us because it's a, it's a systematic methodology that he uses to go through and support what he's going to do. And we look at these themes are so important for us as well to help build up on this. So, I had this problem today. It got right to this one slide here. And it got goofy on me. I thought it was just a little... There's something going on. I don't know. It's just that one slide when I was going on, it wouldn't, it wouldn't change. And I was like, maybe it's just the computer I was on at that time. So that's kind of a part of the historical context in general. Um, but where Paul was at, he was at Corinth when he writes it. Um, and he was on his way back to Jerusalem to deliver a contribution that had been gathered for the needs of the saints. So that kind of targets as well how we can know that where he's at and the date and the year and such that he goes through. Um, he wanted to go to Rome. And this is something that we see where, you know, Paul may have had plans, but the Spirit would either hinder him or tell him to go and direct him. And I think that's an interesting concept when we think about, when we ask, well, who's going to get the gospel and who's not going to get the gospel? And if there's somebody who needs it, I think we can see a pattern even within this, even this statement here that Paul was wanting to go to Rome earlier. Paul was wanting to go into Macedonia and was stopped and then hindered and then told to go. So, you know, it, it, we can, I think we clearly see where the Spirit is involved in helping people who are searching for the Word at the right time to bring the Word to them. So that was something. But he wanted to go to Spain. Now, after this whole journey that when he goes back, he's arrested and he, by ship, goes back up to Rome and he's arrested, he does stand before Nero and he's tried by Nero and he's released. But apparently, real quickly, within a year or two, he's rearrested. And then he's taken back to Rome and then that's the book of Acts actually ends when Paul is in Rome when he is under arrest the first time. A lot of times we think that, well, whenever he ends the book of Acts and they're sitting in Rome, that, ah, well, that's why the story stopped because, well, he died in Rome. No, he was set free at that time. It's the next time. But he wanted to go to Rome. So some historians believe that after the first time he stood before Nero and was set free, he left from Rome and then traveled to Spain, and even possibly as far as England. And there's some other things that kind of support the possibilities of this, and, but we won't drive off too far. Why I say that is because sometimes we are very limited, and that's okay, but when you read this, like when Paul wants to go to Spain, and then later on you hear about, well, no, he couldn't have because he died, he was executed, and we have some limited context what we're looking at, you know, as far as like, 
when things precisely occur. And is that important to your salvation? Nah. But I think it helps to show when you read historically um, some uh, archaeological finds where there were Christians dating back to about 80 A.D. That there were Christians being immersed and stuff. Some very strong patterns of pure Christianity occurring. How did it get there? You have to kind of go, hmm. And then when you come back and you draw the dots and you start to look and go, you know, Paul wanted to go to Spain. Oh, well, he was executed because that's when he was in Rome. That's when he stood before Nero. Ah, no, 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 no. He did not die at that trip. It was later on. So the window of opportunity could have been there. So, um, where are you? Is stick again? It's gonna make, oh, there it goes. So let's look at um, some of the, scene, the themes that we'll find that start to be developed in this. Um, and this is where you're going to see me get really fired up. Because this book is not only of extremely important foundational teaching for the, our theology, and I hate using that word, but establishing our, our, the premise of our, our faith, it's also abused really severely as well in a lot of doctrines of predestination, um, Calvinism, Luther, you know, used the same uh, book to, to take it in his direction, and because we don't know the con context of exactly what Martin Luther was dealing with, it, it's been really abused, the book of Romans. And so I want to clear that up. We're going to use some def definitions, and we'll go through there as we, we proceed. Um, but the first big theme is very similar if you think about the way the gospel is as he starts to flow through this is the natural inclination that we have toward sin and the separation from that that sin problem that's one of the big ones i think is there and that on our own accord without any help you see now i almost hear myself because i just did a calvin lesson you know up in Berlin. But this is still true. There's an aspect of this that's pure. Is that, you know, there, there's no way on our own without God providing us a plan of salvation that we could make it right. We couldn't fix it. It was going to take God from do doing this. And it was through His loving kindness, His agape, that God provided a way for us to be redeemed. Um, and the idea of this theme in here is that it was Christ who paid that. The Roman readers are predominantly Jewish Christians. And so a lot of this is going to be to them what I describe as New Testament teachings of the Gospel supporting Old Testament prophecies and law. Not contradicting. And that's what he's going to go through as he progresses through this. And so this idea of sin and debt and redemption are words and terminologies that flow well for them. And that his plan is just and fair because not all of Israel is going to be saved. And that's a problem he's going to have to expose and bring up is why? Why is it that not all of Israel? Was, were they not the promised? What broke down there? And so did God's word fail? What broke? The other idea is the reconciliation of all of mankind. When we use the word Gentile, we're just talking to everybody else that's not a Jew. So everybody else has an opportunity to come to the same plan of salvation that was first initiated through the Jews and promised, and that's why he's got to work that out. How can not all of Israel be saved, but yet then you turn around and give it to the Gentiles? And you'll see the way he develops the plan that God used was, was amazing, the way he goes through there. The next one is, is the idea of sincere service to Christ you know, is an appropriate way, but it's not the way you're going to be saved. You know, and, and that it's not through the works that you couldn't ever justify what you've done but they're important. And they're important in the context of with others in the church. 
there is a church theme that goes on here. So there's six sections that we're going to go through and kind of look at. Now, this is your outline um, looking at. And of course, section one is the introduction, which is extremely powerful. That's, that, that's Paul at full throttle when he fires up and he starts out with this. And so we're gonna, we'll, we'll start that next week. But, you know, it's a brief summary of the gospel. And the most powerful is this idea of the power of the gospel to what? Save. First to who? The Jew and then the Gentile. Hold that. You know that. We, we, we say it. you got it memorized, don't you? As you go through this, you're going to see Paul saying that. Because it was to the Jew first and then the Gentile. Or to the Jew and the Greek, depending on what translation you have. And so he gives a fast synopsis of it, of this idea. And then he brings in this introduction that I've wanted to come and see you. And, and kind of a little more informal about his plans and stuff. And the idea that God's righteousness has been revealed. That's going to be important when we start to compare some modern teachings on Calvinism and things like this. It's interesting. We've got to tie this in because that's what Paul says that God was doing, was revealing it then. And some of the concepts around modern, or we call it Reformed theology, this, this, almost, this is starting to shake them up because it doesn't make sense. Why would he reveal it to them? They're, they're, they're not going to be saved anyway. Um, but that leaves them with what? Without excuse. So section 2, verses uh, chapter 1 through 18, going over into chapter 4, we see, well, why do you need it? Why is it important? And so this is where I've always looked at it and said, he kind of like levels the playing ground. <laughs> he goes, it's like he goes around the room and picks on everybody. First he starts with the Jew, then he goes to the Gentile, then he goes... You know what? None of you. None of you. It's because it, none of you are deserving of it. And everybody has a need to be justified before God. They have to be justified before God. And that it's a gift. It's grace. Nothing on your behalf. And again, that flows off into some false doctrine that we have to really deal with. Section 3, 5 through, um, coming up into 8, 39, we see where now he starts talking about the blessings of the gospel. Starts out with, why do you need it? Then he moves over and says, these are the blessings you get. And blessings of peace and righteousness and joy allows us to escape the consequences of our sins, frees us from slavery to sin, frees us from slavery to the law, offers us righteousness, righteous life through His Spirit. So, these are the great blessings. Now, uh, keep in mind, there's a difference as he talks terminology-wise when he goes from the, the, the blessings we receive from the Gospel and then the promises. When he starts talking promises and who is he talking to? Because now we're gonna, he's going to go into that. He has to deal with those promises and reconcile why did all of Israel not receive it when they had all the promises. But all the blessings are in this gospel, a completion of it. And ultimately, it gives us what we really want, and that's victory over both sin and death. This is where we're going to get into some exciting stuff in chapter 9, going all the way up into 11, about verse 36 there. And that is where he then explains why Israel didn't just wholeheartedly accept it and that it is God's right and sovereign right to use what he wants to do what he wants to accomplish. If he chooses something over something else, then that's his sovereign right. And that He's going to use this brilliant way of explaining to them something they understand. What do they understand? Well, they know that not every person received a very specific promise. That it went to Abraham, and all of Abraham's seed got a blessing, but not all of Abraham's son. He had six other sons, seven other sons besides Isaac. But they understand, the Jew, that only Isaac got it. And then of those two sons that not both of them received that blessing. Only one son. 
So if you're sitting there saying, well, why did all of, why is some of them not receiving it? Well, not, not all of them have received a specific gift. And so he's going to use that section there to show why Israel rejected and show how God has allowed this process to accomplish the greater purpose there. And the other part of this is the church, the assembly, the called out, the body of Christians. It's always been a part of the plan that he's wanted to accomplish. And that there's been a lot of people miss that, including the Jews that have missed that point. But God still has a plan for Israel. And that's something that is going to be interesting when we look at that. I think you'll enjoy seeing that. Chapter 5 is what we call practical living. It's kind of interesting. He uses the first, the midsection, the bulk of it to deal with kind of systematic theology. And then he comes to the conclusion at the end of the book and talking about the types of, of practical living. And that's going to be really interesting because we get into that idea of chapter 14, Romans 14, about, you know, what's offensive to your brother, you know, can you eat meat, can you not eat meat, and that type of issue. And I've heard people say, well, that's a chapter 14, that's a Romans 14 issue. Well, what does that mean to you? What does that mean? That means we just have to agree to disagree. Eh, watch out for that. You know, that's not always true, just black and white. There's something very specific. So we're going to delve into 14 because I think it's very important. Because when we have conflict among ourselves here, we have to be careful to make sure we do put things in there and not be offensive. And we need to make sure that there are some things we don't put in there that we have to say, sorry, there's a line here. And that's the problem with this ecumenicalism I was telling you about in my other lessons where... Well, it's just a Romans 14. Everybody's got their own plan of salvation. That's not a Romans 14 issue. That's not a don't do something and offend your brother. You know, if he doesn't have the knowledge of it, just let him do his thing. Uh, that's, that's a salvation issue. That's not what Paul was talking about. So that's what I mean about we really got to clear that up. We're going to need to work on that section there. Um, and the idea that he deals with showing how that the spiritual gifts and what we result, the resultant of it is the transformation into God's people. The destiny, the conditions in which He wants us in, that He has reserved for us. He pre chose a condition, and that was His people with certain attributes. This, and that was in Christ, in the image of Christ, in the attributes of Christ. Not some predestiny, some Calvinistic view. Because I can, I, if you don't take things in context, you can build anything you want. You can. So that's why I dig that up. The gospel is the primary concern for the followers of Jesus. It is something that we need to be very concerned on. Chapter 6 is conclusion. It's, you know, every book has a, a concluding. He, he then talks again about his plans, what he wants to do. And this is where I was talking about his plans on, in going to, to Spain and on. And then personal greetings to various people that we'll look at. Um, some, some of the quick takeaways we'll wrap up is uh, that I want us to know, and it's kind of, I'm, I'm doing it on purpose, is one is the gospel shows God's righteousness, not the Mosaic law, not anything else. The gospel is what shows his righteousness. And God's wrath against sin is just. Now, why is that important? Well, it's just. You know, it's not unfair. Those who are going to be punished and receive the wrong end of God's affection, the, the anger, the wrathful part, it's a justified one. Sometimes we look at punishment and we see the court systems and sometimes it's right, but sometimes we have seen where the wrath of the legal system was unfair, but not with God. Everything that God is going to do when it comes to that is, is just. God has a plan of salvation. In chapter 6 of Romans, we'll dive into that, where he shows very clearly this method and plan of salvation. And that our faith brings us hope and that that is something that we're going to need to know is that 
faith. So that's one of the key takeaways. Um, the gospel provides for Israel and the Gentiles. It's not separate. And he also then will deal with the idea that just because the Gentiles have come in and some of those branches of Jews have been rejected, he, he warns the Gentiles, hey, you can still lose your branch. <laughs> you can still be taken out yourself. And if God could take and graft in something that's unnatural back into an olive tree, uh, don't you think he could bring back the branch he broke off that was natural and graft them back in and rip you out? Don't sit on your laurels. You, you need to be careful. You know, it's, so there's that concept as well, the big takeaway. Paul gives instructions for everyday living. And righteousness, how we deal, how we associate with others as well, 12 through chapter 15. And then Paul tells his plan to spread the gospel and how his methodology and what he wants to do. And then he closes it up, um, wraps it up. So that's kind of the overview. Like I said, it's kind of the syllabus class. It's not as dynamic or exciting, but you've got the outlines. If you're online and you would like to get a copy of the outline, let me know. I'll get you a copy of the outline so you can kind of go with us. So this will give you at least, and I don't think that every lesson I'm going to be able to take like each section, so it's not going to be a six-sermon series <laughs> according to the sections on your outline because I know there's some that are going to be big. It'll take a little bit more. But I really need you to study and read so that when I'm going through it, it'll help you really be able to dig in and enjoy what we're trying to show and then it's going to help you to help others that are being misguided with some doctrine that's out there. And that's what I want to empower you with is the knowledge of God's word versus what you see being taught. And this is one of the most abused books when it comes to that. So if you're here this evening and we can help you at all in your relationship with Jesus Christ, I hope that you will take this moment while we sing to evaluate if you need to be baptized or you need the prayers of the church, I hope that you would allow us to minister to you. And if you're comfortable, come forward while we stand and we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained.